Coming up, Nicola Sturgeon's husband is arrested as part of a probe into the SNP's finances. Why the Queen Consort will be known as Queen Camilla after the coronation. And Dame Deborah and the legacy she left for cancer research. That's all after the break. The former boss of the Scottish National Party is being questioned by police, investigating how the party is financed. Peter Murrell, the husband of the former First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, was arrested at home this morning. It comes barely a week after the SNP elected its new leader. I was told uh, this morning after the event, um, and of course my reaction, as you'd imagine, uh, much like uh, anybody involved in, in the SNP, is that this is a difficult day. Also this lunchtime, an insult. Donald Trump's angry response to the criminal charges brought against him. We are a nation in decline. And now these radical left lunatics want to interfere with our elections by using law enforcement. Queen Camilla, a new title for the king's wife at his coronation and... I cannot thank you enough for your continued support of the Balbo Fund. An extraordinary legacy, the millions raised for cancer research by Dame Deborah James. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Geraint Vincent. Good afternoon. The Scottish National Party says this lunchtime that it is cooperating fully with a police investigation which has led to the arrest of the man who was, until last month, the party's chief executive. Peter Murrell, who is married to the former First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, was taken into police custody this morning. The police say they've carried out searches at a number of addresses today as part of their inquiry into the funding and finances of the SNP. There is right now a large police presence at the couple's home. With the latest, here's Neil Connery. This morning, police officers were at the Glasgow home of former SNP chief executive Peter Morell and his wife, former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. An incident tent was set up in the front garden with a number of police vehicles on site. Police Scotland say this is one of a number of locations being searched as part of an investigation into SNP finances. Officers were also at the SNP's Edinburgh headquarters with police vans seen parked outside and uniformed officers standing inside the building. Peter Morell has been married to Nicola Sturgeon since 2010. He's played a leading role in the SNP and resigned as the party's chief executive last month, a post he had held since 1999. In a statement, Police Scotland said, a 58-year-old man has today, Wednesday, 5th of April 2023, been arrested as a suspect in connection with the ongoing investigation into the funding and finances of the Scottish National Party. The man is in custody and is being questioned by Police Scotland detectives. I was told uh, this morning after the event, um, and of course my reaction, as you'd imagine, uh, much like uh, anybody involved in, in the SNP, is that this is a difficult day uh, for the party. But again, I just reiterate and emphasise it's so important for me not to comment on a live police investigation and see, be seen to prejudice that in any way, shape or form. Nicola Sturgeon announced her decision to stand down as Scotland's First Minister in February, saying she felt she no longer had what it takes to keep going in the role. Today I am announcing my intention to step down as First Minister. The SNP's political opponents have called for full transparency following this morning's developments. Scottish Labour's deputy leader called it a deeply concerning development, while Scottish Conservatives said SNP politicians must cooperate fully with the investigation. Neil Connery, ITV News. Well, our Scotland correspondent, Peter Smith, is at Nicola Sturgeon's home in Glasgow. Peter, what's the latest you have? Well, police are continuing the search into the house behind me where, as you say, Peter Murrell and Nicola Sturgeon live. Um, locally, we've been told that Nicola Sturgeon left the home 
early this morning. She was picked up in a car. About 20 minutes later, uh, the police arrived. They've set up a tent where the search is being conducted. There are items being removed into a vehicle that's parked inside the tent, and the tent erected for privacy so that we can't see exactly what's going on. But we do know that Peter Murrell has been arrested, and he is considered a suspect in connection with the ongoing investigation into funding and finances of the Scottish National Party. Now, Peter Murrell was, as we know, chief executive of the SNP for 24 years until he resigned last month, and he is Nicola Sturgeon's husband. These two have been the most powerful couple in Scotland for much of the last decade, but he is now in custody. He's been questioned by Police Scotland detectives. They have 12 hours to question him, and if needed, that can be extended for another 12 hours. Officers are also carrying out searches at a number of addresses. As part of this investigation, we know that SNP headquarters is subject to searches, and we've heard reaction from the new party leader and Scotland's First Minister, Hamza Yusuf. He, of course, replaced Nicola Sturgeon. Now, this police investigation goes back 18 months. It was triggered when questions were raised about how more than £600,000 raised for independence campaigning had been spent. Um, that more than £600,000 was raised, but of course there has not been an independence referendum for it to be spent on. More questions were then raised after SNP accounts showed the party had just £97,000 in the bank at the end of 2019. Uh, last year, Emerge Peter Murrell had given a loan of more than £100,000 to help with cash flow issues. Um, and Police Scotland uh, are now uh, questioning Peter Murrell. They say a report will be sent to the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service. All right, Peter, many thanks. After becoming the first American president in history to face criminal charges, Donald Trump ended his day in court yesterday with a defiant message to his supporters. In a speech in Florida last night, Mr Trump told his audience that the case against him was an insult to our country. He's accused of falsifying business records to hide damaging information during his 2016 election run. Robert Moore reports from Florida. Donald Trump arrived back in Florida last night, a criminal defendant. But his loyalists turned out anyway in their hundreds for his return. A former president who has suffered the ultimate ignominy of being charged with multiple felonies acknowledged his cheering supporters. And they in turn made clear they see the charges not as a source of shame, but as a badge of honor. Back at his Mar-a-Lago resort, Trump launched a scathing attack on the Even indictment, the left, first the targeting the New York Attorney General. Alvin Bragg of New York, <laughs> who campaigned on the fact that he would get President Trump. I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. Then Trump spoke of his humiliation in that New York courtroom. A moment that may have changed the contours of the 2024 presidential race. Now they have really stepped up their efforts by indicting the 45th president of the United States who received <laughs> 75 million votes, which is more than any sitting president in the history of our country. It's clear that Trump's ordeal in New York has only embittered him further. Our justice system has become lawless. They're using it now, in addition to everything else, to win elections. A day after the indictments in that New York courtroom, and his supporters are out here on the streets of West Palm Beach to show support and solidarity. But wherever Donald Trump and his legal team look, there is further jeopardy ahead. But one of his top allies and fundraisers told ITV News that the indictment has just given Trump a huge boost. This is all political. It's disgusting. The witch hunts need to end. And do you feel like this is going to set back Donald Trump's presidential hopes? No, absolutely not. It enhanced him. Are you kidding me? He went up 10 points today in the polls. The evil just made a bad move. This is a spiritual battle of epic proportion. With a very dark cloud. Donald Trump warned of dangerous times ahead, and he continues to polarize a nation. That we will make America great again. Thank you very much. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. And he is back where he wants to be.
at the very center of America's heated political battle. Robert Moore, ITV News, Florida. The parents and children of victims of the contaminated blood scandal should be entitled to compensation. That is the view of the chairman of the inquiry, who said their loss had not been recognised. Thousands of people were infected with HIV and hepatitis by contaminated blood between 1970 and 1991. The scandal has been described as the worst treatment disaster in the history of the NHS. Well, our health correspondent, Martin Stew, is at the inquiry. Martin, what will this mean for the families, families of those victims? Well, they're certainly seeing it as a big step on their very long journey to justice. As you mentioned, around 30,000 people were infected and either contracted HIV or hepatitis C as a result of being treated with uh, contaminated blood products in the 70s and 80s. Now, the public inquiry isn't meant to publish its full report until the autumn, but its chair said the level of trauma and angst caused by the delays means that he needs, to, he needs compensation process to start immediately for a wider range of family members. It must be right not only to recognize people's losses through compensation, but also to provide the specialist psychological support not offered over several decades to people infected and affected. Now, £100,000 interim payments were actually paid to victims or spouses last year. What's been recommended now is for that payment to be extended to those who didn't have a spouse, uh, to either their children uh, or their parents. So one person who uh, may be impacted uh, is Jason, who I spoke to earlier. His dad died when he was just four with AIDS. Uh, he said it's not the money so much as the acknowledgement which really matters. The biggest thing for me personally is the recognition that they were infected and they died because they were infected and that it was the fault of those who were in the uh, decision-making chairs at, at the hands of the state. And that acknowledgement, that recognition is the single biggest thing. Now, those interim payments are over £100,000. The final bill is likely to be much higher, running to millions of pounds per victim and potentially costing the government billions. OK, Martin, many thanks. The port of Dover is bringing in emergency measures to make sure travellers don't face huge delays this bank holiday weekend. Coach companies are meeting transport officials this afternoon to try to avoid a repeat of the chaos there last weekend. Tomorrow is expected to be one of the busiest days of the year. Well, Chloe Keedy is in Dover. Chloe, what are they planning on doing then? Well, this is very much a developing situation this lunchtime. I've just heard in the past few minutes that those talks have just finished. Um, and we've also heard in the past hour from the port of Dover setting out a sort of series of emergency measures, if you like, to help things run smoothly this weekend. The aim is to avoid a repeat of what happened last weekend when people were stuck, uh, people travelling by coach were stuck, many of them school children trying to get away uh, on their Easter holidays, delayed for absolutely hours on end, some of them up to 18 hours just waiting to get into the port and onto a ferry. The port has said that um, coach traffic here is expected to be about a third lower than it was last weekend, but it is still going to be very busy, peaking on Good Friday. So what they've said is that ferry companies are working with coach companies to spread the travel across a three-day period. And I'm told that what that could mean for passengers is that the time of your crossing might get moved. But if you don't hear anything, you should come here at the time you're expecting to come here. And crucially, uh, don't try and come here early. They've also said they're installing some temporary infrastructure to help process people uh, and that the French Border Force are supplying some extra staff. I've just spoken to the uh, CPT, the, the trade body for coach companies, and they've said that broadly they welcome uh, these measures, but that they will be watching very closely this weekend to see if they work. Chloe, thank you very much. Still to come this lunchtime, Queen Camilla, a new official title for the wife of the king. And the lasting legacy of Dame Deborah James. 
First, just days after a new round of teachers' strikes was announced in England, a head teachers' union has rejected a pay offer from the government. The National Association of Head Teachers, which mainly represents primary school heads, is considering balloting its members again over strikes. Well, our political correspondent, Carl Dinan, uh, is here. Carl, what was the offer and why is it being rejected? Well, this is the same offer has, as has already been rejected by two other teachers' unions. So that's a £1,000 lump sum to teachers this year and a 4.5% pay rise next year. What's significant, I think, here is that the National Association of Head Teachers have not been on strike before. I think they can be seen as a, a more moderate union. But 78% of them want to ballot, ballot a second time, but want to have a ballot on strike action after 90% of them rejected this pay offer. And they have a particular view of this as the people who look after school budgets because a large chunk of the pay offer the government was making was supposed to come from existing budgets. And as one head teacher who's already reducing staff members told us, she simply doesn't have the money in her budget to increase staff pay. If I have to fund 4% of any pay award or any of any pay award really, I cannot do that because I will have to strip back the staff even further. Um, and we're getting then into, into areas where I don't even believe it will be safe for the children, let alone providing a good education. Now, that's not going to currently happen because the government have withdrawn the pay offer that they made and have said that pay for next year will now be set by the pay review body. But that's a situation that teachers in these unions were already not happy with. So we are looking at ongoing industrial action uh, and now including the National Association of Head Teachers in all likelihood should they vote to go for strike action. Mm. OK, Carl Denham, many thanks. Now, we are just over one month away from the coronation of King Charles at Westminster Abbey. Invitations have been sent out, and among the details on them is the dropping of the word consort from Queen Camilla's title. Well, uh, Lizzie Robinson has very deftly replaced Carl in the chair uh, beside me. Lizzie, is this news a surprise? Look, without question, it has been a remarkable journey for the former Camilla Parker Bowles. If you rewind back to 2005 when she married the then Prince Charles, it was announced that she intended one day to become princess consort. And that was very much a sensitive reflection of the public mood at the time. And then last year, the late Queen, she said that it was her sincere wish that Camilla become known as Queen Consort, and that is how she has officially been referred to since her death last September. But now, um, here's a look at the official coronation mm. invitation that has been released by Buckingham Palace. And on it, it says, Their Majesties King Charles III and Queen Camilla. The first time she has been referred to as such officially, and it reveals that post-coronation, she will be known as simply the Queen or Queen Camilla, with those close to her saying that it is an appropriate time to drop the consort and very much in keeping with previous Queen consorts that have gone before. So we've been out today to see what the public make of the change. Great news. Excellent. Yeah, all the way behind that. I think they're a good image for the, ro for the royal family. So uh, I'm quite happy with it, yes. I think that's great. I think she deserves it. And I think... I think she's a lovely person and... We all need to accept her as queen now. We've also begun to get some more details about the coronation ceremony, including the eight pages that will take part uh, in that moment on May the 6th. And the most prominent of those is Prince George, nine-year-old Prince George. He will be a page to his grandfather, the king. Big day for the little boy. <laughs> Many thanks, Lizzie. Lifeboat crews are urging people planning trips to the coast over the Easter break to be aware of tide times. This video of RNLI volunteers rescuing a group in Cornwall after the area was cut off by the tide on Monday was released today. Three people and a dog were left stranded near Par Beach until they were rescued. Joe Biden will fly to Northern Ireland and Ireland next week. The White House says it's to mark the progress made since the Good Friday Agreement 25 years ago. The president, who is, of course, of Irish descent, often makes reference to his roots. And Tom Daly and his husband, Dustin Lance Black, have announced the birth of their second baby. The couple's second son, named Phoenix Rose, was born last week via a surrogate. They revealed the news with an announcement in The Times 
newspaper. Finally, this lunchtime, rebellious hope was the phrase Deborah James used to describe her response to her terminal bowel cancer diagnosis. Her courage was an inspiration. She spent the last months of her life encouraging people to make sure they were aware of the signs of the disease and to get checked. The fund that she set up before her death last summer has now raised more than £11 million and the charity Cancer Research UK says it's a powerful testament to how many lives she touched. Faye Barker has the story. Hello, I'm Deborah James, otherwise known as a bow babe. One thing Even in death, Dame Deborah's legacy lives on through her bow babe fund. I wanted to set it up to ensure that more people can benefit from some of the things that I benefited from. Today, her mum spoke of her continued pride in her daughter, whose fund has raised over £11 million in less than a year. She set a target of 250000 and I think within a day it hit a million and she was just overwhelmed, as we all were. And um, I just wish she was here to see it was £11.3 but we're not going to stop there. Besides the money, that's amazing. I just want to thank every supporter. There was over 330,000 individual supporters. That is overwhelming. The money is already funding several projects supported by Deborah's family, including here at the Institute of Cancer Research in London. It's funding our ongoing research from Cancer Research UK to look into how bowel cancers um, become able to spread around the body. What we know is that when bowel cancers do spread around the body, they're much harder to treat. So if we can work out what enables them to spread in the first place, we might be able to get in and stop that and improve outcomes for patients. As well as improving research and treatments for bowel cancer, Dame Deborah's aim was to break the stigma surrounding the disease. Too sexy for your even if it meant dressing as a giant poo to make the point. But it worked, with NHS England crediting her campaign for a record number of people being referred for bowel cancer checks. She was made a dame in the weeks before her death last year, her efforts no doubt saving lives and continuing to do so. I cannot thank you enough for your continued support of the Bowel Bay Fund. You are awesome. Faye Barker. ITV News. And that is it this lunchtime. Lucrezia will be here with the evening news at 6.30. The news where you are follows the national weather from the lunchtime news team. Bye-bye. Today we'll see warmer temperatures moving in from the east especially around tea time. Heinz Beans sponsors ITV National Weather. Hello, a very good afternoon to you. A rather wet and cloudy start across much of the UK today. The southeast holding on to bright skies for the time being, but it will cloud over there later as a rain band pushes its way eastwards across most parts of the country through the day. One or two heavy bursts. It's dreary and grey out there for the most part. But for Western Scotland and Northern Ireland this afternoon, perhaps some late brightness. And temperature wise, not feeling incredibly pleasant either. 10 or 11 degrees at best. As we head into this evening, that rain continues to push its way eastwards, disintegrating as it does so, but leaving behind low cloud mistiness, a murky, damp night to come for many parts of the country. And that means we're free from frost, seven or eight Celsius, the overnight low. Rain will position itself along eastern coasts as we start the day tomorrow, and Thursday will be a mixture of warm sunny spells and scattered heavy showers. There could even be some hail and thunder in the mix, particularly for Yorkshire and East Anglia tomorrow afternoon. Heinz Beans sponsors ITV National Weather.